Well, good morning, Center Point family. Thank you for joining us online for our gathering today. If this is your first time with us, uh, we're a church that makes Jesus the center point of our lives, and our aim is to make him known from the center point of Utah Valley. We're thankful that you tuned in today. Uh, many of you have been asking us the question, when are we going to start meeting again at the church? We hear you. And we've been working really hard to answer that question. It seems like every single time we have a plan, there's some new development that forces us to change that plan. But at this time, we're looking at reopening our physical location sometime mid to late June. However, please keep in mind that the recommendations regarding COVID-19 change rapidly. So this date could be pushed up or it could be pushed back as new developments arise. The time frame here is not a guarantee, but it's a hope. And when we do reopen our physical location, we're gonna to continue to have the live stream experience each Sunday. Whether you and your family choose to come in person or worship from home is a decision that only you can make. But please know this, you are loved and valued regardless of how you and your family decide to worship with us, online in your homes or here at our physical location. We'll keep you up to date as things develop. Well, this morning, lead pastor Scott McKinney is going to kick off a new series called I Still Believe. But before we do, our Center Point band is going to lead us in a brief time of singing. Every Sunday in our regular gatherings, we spend some time singing songs of faith that remind us of who God is and what He's done. And we're going to continue doing that even though we're not together in person. I encourage you to gather whoever is in your home and worship with us. You can sing along or you can just listen and be encouraged by the truth in these lyrics. Church starts right now. Hi, my name is Blythe Snowden and I am planning on attending the University of Utah in the fall. And my favorite memory from being at Center Point was my first year of junior high camp. I was super duper shy, but um, I quickly learned that camp was like my favorite thing to do every single summer. My name is Keegan Kemp. I will be going to Gillette College to play soccer under a scholarship. Hi, my name is Gracie Kemp. I am a junior, but I'm actually graduating a year early. My future plans are to work in my family's business for the next year so I can save up and hopefully travel. And I will also either be attending nail school or esthetician school in the fall. My favorite center point memories are probably the insane amount of cups of coffee I drink at church trying to keep myself awake. And my all time favorite memory is my first year at center point was my first year at winter camp. And I was with my close friends, Carly, and Kylie and we were hiking through the snow to go sledding and I was wearing leggings that didn't turn out too well for me but yeah thank you hi my name is Cody Knappenberger right now I am a senior at Timpanogos High School it's a great day to be a T-Wolf um, hopefully in the fall I will be an Aggie though attending Utah State majoring in human biology um, something I've always appreciated about Center Point is just how real they are. Um, I will come with real problems and real worries, and I will always receive real answers. I think in this world, in our society, we get convenient answers, and those always don't hold truth. But I'm always appreciative of tough answers to tough questions, and if you ever have questions for them, they will always support you with whatever's going on in your life. and. I love Centerpoint and I love my CP gang and uh, thank you so much to them for the support they've played in my life since I was a little kid. So, love you guys. Hi, my name is Chasen Jones. I'm a senior and I'm graduating from Utah County Academy of Sciences and Utah Valley University. Uh, Centerpoint has been a really big part of my entire high school career and it's just been somewhere that I can go to and feel so safe and at home with all the people that I know there. and. My favorite experience probably would be Good Friday because I think that service is just so good. Every single year it just gives me chills thinking about it. Hi, I'm Taylor Fagan. I'm 18 and I'm going to be graduating from Walden. I have been a part of Center Point for about nine years. It's been amazing growing with the people that are there and just growing with myself and growing closer to God. I think one of my favorite memories is probably whenever I played Gaga Ball 
and I played for about four hours straight one time and it was insane. It's probably just my favorite thing ever. I love the Gaga Ball Pit. If you know, you know. I also love worshiping and just seeing the beautiful nature up at Big Canyon. I'm just so blessed for everything that I've learned from Center Point and all the people that I have become closer to. Good morning, Center Point Church. Let's worship together. Good. 
There is fear, there is tension, turmoil among us. I see us. Where there is doubt and the disquiet, disbelief and divided, short-sighted, I see us. Indecision and insecurity, division and immaturity, I see us. Angry citizens with fingers pointed, looking at governings or any scapegoat to exploit. I see us. We need a hero, but want a villain. Disregard the savior who came for trillions. I see us. Looking to science for our soul guidance instead of the guide of our souls who died for us. I see us. We searching for normal instead of supernatural. We find the damage and miss the miracle. I see us. Do we still believe in you, Jesus? Do we believe in your faithfulness? Daily reminding us the sun rises and you provide for us. I see you, your love that you defined in Christ. Heavy the price, but more than suffice. I see you, you already responded to this. Raised your voice, said, I'll take the consequence. My life in the gutter, you pulled me out of the mess. I see you, open our eyes to the Utah skies, mountains, rocks, and rivers. Your designs, I see you, Jesus. You opened eyes and fed thousands, brought life to lakes and raised Lazarus. I see you. In your creation of us, your relationship with us, the past and present, the future, Jesus. I see miracles, this ain't mythical, it's biblical. These signs, non-fictional, always original, unequivocal, so meaningful. You're the God that loves every individual. I see you, and I still believe. When I was 19 years old, about a year after I became a Christian, I met a guy by the name of Mike. Mike and his wife, Becky, married right out of high school. Becky was the cheerleader, and Mike played football, and they both were rock-solid Christians. And uh, they had dreams of a wonderful life together. They had this storybook romance. But at the age of 22, as, uh, as Becky was having her second child, they discovered that she had a rare blood disease, and within a year she died. And her death rocked a lot of people. Uh, I didn't know her, but I went to the funeral with a friend that was close to her. And I went with this question, how do you explain this? And uh, I walked away from the funeral saying, after what I've seen, my life cannot be the same. Because somehow in the midst of this inexplicable suffering, the gospel was preached, Jesus was lifted up, and as a result of this, I got to know Mike, and he had invited me to a Bible study that he led at his house, and I wanted to get to know Mike because I still had this question, and it was this, Mike, after all that you've been through, do you still believe? And I went to that study for several months, and the answer was clearly yes. Uh, in time, Mike moved away, and my life moved on, but that experience made me realize something about following Jesus. And it was this. Jesus does not promise us an, an easy life. He promised us that in this world we will have tribulation. And, and the greatest witnesses to Jesus are not those that say something like this. I gave my life to Jesus and I ended up having this incredibly perfect life with a perfect marriage and perfect family and perfect career and perfect house and perfect so on. Real life is filled with pain and suffering. It's filled with tribulation. It's filled with unanswered questions. And the greatest witnesses that I've experienced to the Christian faith are when people go through life with all that it brings our way, all the difficulties, all the problems, and they say, I still believe. Well, this morning, we're going to begin a series in the Gospel of John, and we're calling this series, I Still Believe. And the reason is that after reading John's account of the life of Jesus, I believe that what John is doing in, this, uh, in, in his gospel is he is saying to a new generation of Christ followers that I still believe. Let me give you some background. There are four Gospels. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share a lot of the same material. Uh, in fact, it is said that they, they look at the life of Jesus with the same eye. But John's Gospel is different. It agrees on the basics. Jesus came. He ministered. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. They, it, they do sh it, John does share some material with the other three gospel, but there's a lot of material in John that is not in the other gospels. And the reason that it is different is because of who John was. Five different times in the gospel of John, 
uh, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. You might say that John was the best friend of Jesus. John was there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he was there at the end. In fact, at the very end, while Jesus is on the cross dying, John is the only disciple that is there. And right before Jesus dies, we see this exchange between Jesus and John. When it says this, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that, on time, that time on, this disciple, John, took her, Mary, into his home. John entrusts. Jesus entrusts John with the responsibility of caring for his mother. Who would you ask to do something like that? You'd ask your best friend. And what that does is that makes this gospel very personal. But there's something else that makes John's gospel different. It has to do with when it was written. Look at the timeline that we have here. And, and what we see in this timeline is that Jesus' ministry took place uh, around 30 A.D. And uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the first three Gospels, are written sometime between 50 and 70 A.D. But John writes his Gospel in, in about 90 A.D. John writes as an older man looking back on his life and on the life of Jesus. And what John is doing is he's writing at a time when all the other apostles had been put to death for the faith. John was the last of the apostles, and the la he was the last one that heard Jesus teach and, and saw him heal. John is the last of the living eyewitnesses among the apostles of the resurrection. John is the lone survivor. He is the last man standing. And John is writing to a generation of Christians that is being persecuted. And this second generation of Christians, they do not believe because what they have seen, they believe because of the testimony of those that had seen. They believe because of the testimony of eyewitnesses like John and the rest of the apostles. And if I was a Christian living at the end of the first century in the midst of the persecution that they were going through at that time, and I knew that John was still alive, I would want to get to John somehow and ask him the question, John, do you still believe? After all that you've seen, after all that you've been through, do you still believe? Because if John doesn't believe, well, then this Christian faith is not true. But John's answer is found in his gospel. He still believes, and not only does he still believe, he writes his gospel so that others will believe. He says in John 20, 31, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, you, that, that by believing you may have life in his name. And that word believe is central to the gospel of John. John uses that word believe in one way or another 84 times. Now, we all know what it means to believe. Uh, it means to trust or to have faith that something is true. Why do we believe in regular life that something is true? In everyday life, we believe things to be true based on evidence. And sometimes that evidence is firsthand. We see something or we hear something, and, and we believe it because of our own experience. And sometimes... We believe because of secondhand evidence. We believe lots of things because of our confidence in the people that give us information. Somebody that I trust tells me something, and I trust that person, so I believe it. In a court of law, we rely on the testimony of reliable witnesses all the time. And that's the way it works in life. That's the way it works at work. That's the way it works when it comes to relationships. When it comes to the relationships, anytime we have to decide the truth, we, we look for evidence. And that seems to hold true except when it comes to religion. You ask some people, and even some Christians, and they will tell you they believe. And that you, ask them why, you ask them why they believe, and they will say, well, you know, I just believe. I, I, I just take it by faith. Uh, what we tend to do is we tend to divorce faith from evidence. And when you find yourself struggling, if you look at it this way, when you find yourself struggling to believe, what you'll sometimes hear is people say something like this to you. Well, you just need more faith. 
You get this idea that to believe in God and in the Christian faith means that you have to believe without any evidence to support that belief. <coughs> Frank Turek is a defender of the Christian faith, and he speaks on a lot of college campuses, and he debates. But here's what he says uh, that I, I think makes a lot of sense. He says, the reason so many people are easily talked out of Christianity is because they were never talked into it in the first place. Maybe you grew up in a church where you were told, well, you, you just have to believe. Uh, you just have to have faith. And that worked when you were young. You believed because the preacher or the Sunday school teacher or the parent or the grandparent told you that you just have to believe. And then you grew up and you read a book or you heard a debate or you heard a lecture. And, and, and somebody talked you out of the Christian faith because nobody ever talked you into it in the first place. And after reading John's gospel, I think that the Apostle John would hear that idea that all you got to do is believe and would say, where did you get that idea? Says who? Because you don't find that idea in the teachings of Jesus. John did not believe Jesus because Jesus told him, John, you just got to believe. John believed because of what he saw. Look at 1 John 1.1. This is the Apostle John writing. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, concerning Jesus. What had John seen with his own eyes? Look at John 20, verse 30. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In, in his book, in the Gospel of John, John is writing about the miracles that he has seen. And he calls these miracles signs. And signs exist to point us to something. And the last and greatest and most important sign that proves that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, is the resurrection of Jesus. Because John had seen with his own eyes Jesus die and come back to life, he believed that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The resurrection of Jesus, though, is not the only sign that John witnessed. In his gospel, John tells us about seven other signs that he had witnessed. Each of these signs point to Jesus and to his identity. And what we're going to do in this series, we're going to talk about, we're going to look at each of these seven miracles, these seven signs. And the first sign we're going to look at is in John chapter 2, where Jesus turns the water into wine. Let's look at John 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana, at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples also had been invited to the wedding. I want you to notice the detail. The wedding happened on the third day, which probably means it happened on a Tuesday, which according to the Jewish calendar was Tuesday. Jesus' mother was there, and somehow she is a part of the hosting committee for this wedding. Jesus and his disciples are there on the invite because they're on the invite list. And that means that John, who is writing this, was actually there and was witness to these events. And it says in verse 3 that when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now wedding celebrations in those days went on for several days. And this one, somebody had not planned well, and they have run out of wine. This was a social catastrophe. We do not know what it would have been like to have Jesus for a son. But uh, somehow she knows that in a crisis, her son could be very resourceful. So she says, they have no more wine. And Jesus responds, and he says, woman. Now, kids, don't try that at home. Uh, and I can already hear some of you saying to your mom, calling your mom woman, and saying, mom, I'm only doing this because I'm trying to be like Jesus. Understand something. This is not a term of disrespect. This is actually kind of a formal address. It, it means something more like ma'am or my lady. And, and it's like he's in this formal situation and he doesn't want to say, Mom! <laughs> well, in verse 4, Jesus says, Woman, why do you involve me? And Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. 
Mom, I've, not, I've come to save the world. I, I've not come to save this wedding. This was not how Jesus planned to go public. But there is this thing about moms. Moms are really hard to say no to. My mom and dad have both passed away, but in uh, their later years, my dad could be very difficult, and, and I would get these calls from my mom who would say, Honey, I need you to come over right now because your daddy, he is just so difficult. And, uh, and one time I got one of those calls when I was on the golf course playing the round of golf of my life. I'm not a great golfer or anything, but I was two under par uh, after seven holes, and I said, I am finally going to break par. And at that moment, after I said that, I got a call from my mother, and she said, Son, you need to come right now. I need help with your daddy. And I said, Mom, can it wait 45 minutes? And she said, well, I suppose so, son. You go on and do whatever you think you need to do. And I said, okay. I then lined up my shot and shanked it in the water. Lined up another shot, shanked it in the water. And I said, shank you very much, Mom. <laughs> and I, uh, I put my clubs in my bag. I left the golf course and I went home to take care of my dad and lesson that I should have learned a lot earlier in life. You just don't say mo no to mom. Well, Jesus you know, doesn't say no to his mom here. Uh, he says, woman, why do you involve Mary, me? And Mary just kind of smiles and walks off and ignores him and turns in verse 5 to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. And then she walks off expecting that Jesus is going to take care of the situation because she's the mom. So what does Jesus do? Nearby stood six water jar, stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. See, John is explaining to the non-Jewish uh, readers that are reading this what those stone water jars are for. The Jewish law demanded that Jews... Uh, do certain kinds of washings before they did certain things in order to remain ceremonially clean. And there were all different traditions that, uh, that told people how to wash for different events. And these water jars are, are sitting there empty. And, and they, they, these water jars represent something. They are religious icons they, they have religious significance. And what they do is they represent God's temporary arrangement with the Jewish people established on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the law. And when it was given, the law was perfect. But it was given, it was way ahead of, it, way ahead of its time. But the law had a timer on it. And when Jesus showed up, its time had come to an end. And Jesus decides to use this moment to illustrate something that they would never have understood at that wedding. But God's temporary arrangement with Israel was coming to an end because now with Jesus, there's going to be a new covenant. In verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And after those jars are filled to the brim, something happens. The water is turned into wine. And it is a symbol of the old passing away and new things coming. And then in verse 8, it says that Jesus told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. This miracle was kind of an undercover miracle. The only people that knew about it were the servants that drew the water. The wedding guests did not know what had happened. The master of the banquet did not know what had happened. But after he tasted the wine, he said, he, he called the bridegroom aside and he said, you know, everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. And that's the way it's normally done. And he just makes an observation that, People will start at a wedding with the fine wine, but by the end of the night, after everybody's had too much to drink and no longer care, they bring out the cheap wine. But he says this, but you have saved the best until now. Now, years later, as John thinks back on this 
miracle. And as he writes this account of the life of Jesus, John realizes that there really is no better way to introduce what Jesus had come to do than by telling the story of Jesus turning the water into wine. The water that they poured into these empty vessels provided for purification, outer purification as laid down by the Jewish law. The Jewish law could keep the outside clean, but Christ came to do something better. He came to bring new life. John ends this account of this miracle at this wedding in Cana by saying what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Jesus did not just do miracles to do miracles. These signs had a purpose. The supernatural acts of Jesus, the healings, the walking on water, the feeding of the 5,000, they, they were not just random acts of kindness where Jesus was showing off. Jesus did these miracles so that we might believe. And the disciples did believe. There's an important reason that this particular sign of changing the water into wine was so important to the generation that John is writing to. Look at our timeline again. John is writing after 70 A.D., and something happened in 70 A.D. that changed everything. The Jews had been in an open revolt against Rome. Rome had finally had enough. They marched their armies to Jerusalem. They surrounded the city. They broke down the walls. They defeated what was left of the Jewish army. They drove the Jewish people out of the city and scattered them among the nations, and they destroyed the temple. You've got to understand something. Jesus and his disciples were Jewish. The church began in Jerusalem. In Acts 2, the first place that the church met was in the temple courts. And now the temple is gone. Imagine the impact that this had on the early Christians. Imagine what it would be like for Washington, D.C. to be destroyed and for the United States to cease to exist. A lot of us might be wondering around, wondering, well, how do we go on after this? How can we still believe? And that's why it's important to see what comes next in the Gospel of John. See, the next thing that Jesus does after turning, the next thing that John records after, after Jesus turns the water into wine is a time where Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, to the temple, and he sees the buyers and the sellers outside the temple exchanging money, selling animals, making money off of what is going on in the temple. And Jesus starts overturning the tables, <coughs> and he drives the buyers and sellers out of the temple, and he says, stop turning my father's house into a market. And those in charge of the temple show up, and they say, in effect, who do you think you are? And they ask, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? And Jesus says, you want a sign? I will show you a sign. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, hey, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? What Jesus has said makes no sense to anybody that is questioning Jesus. And it probably didn't make anything, any sense to the disciples as well. It took 46 years for Herod to build this building. You're going to tear it down and rebuild it in three days? But then John adds this explanation. The temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. After the resurrection, the disciples said to one another, Hey, remember when Jesus said, destroy this temple? And on three days, and after three days, I'll raise it up again? Now we understand what that means. When Jesus died on the cross, his body was destroyed. But on the third day, it came to life again. See, and the point that John is making here is that the Christian faith is not dependent on a building, on a temple. God used the temple in Jerusalem to accomplish his purposes for a time. But God's purpose was far greater than the temple of Jer in Jerusalem. God's purpose is far greater than one nation. 
John 3, 16, this verse that we all know so well, God so loved the world, not one nation, the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus came to bring new life to the world, and he has created this unstoppable movement called the church that has outlasted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It, it outlasted the fall of the Roman Empire. It has outlasted empires and all sorts of kingdoms, and if America should cease to exist, it would outlast America. See, our faith has this incredible capacity to overcome death. And as John writes to the church in his time, he is telling a generation of Christ followers that the Christian faith is not dependent on some holy place or a group of holy people or one nation or some religious organization. It is dependent on Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, who came to bring new life. People wanted to know, John... In spite of all that you've been through, in spite of all that you've seen, do you still believe? And he could say, yes, I, I still believe. Why did he believe? Not because someone had said, you just got to have faith, brother. You just got to have faith, sister. He believes because he had seen the one who died come back to life. What about you? Do you ever struggle to believe? Well, here's some good news. Jesus knows that sometimes it is hard to believe. After appearing to his disciples in John 20, 29, Jesus makes these, this statement to those disciples. He says, because you have seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He is saying to these disciples, look, you've seen me. You, you've touched me. You, you, you've heard me in, in this resurrected body. And you, you believe because of that. But there are people that down through the ages that they're going to believe not because they have seen, but because they're going to believe you. And when they believe, they are blessed. And we are among those that are blessed. And, and, and he knows, Jesus knows, that sometimes we struggle. And he responds to the kind of faith that says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And I want you to know one reason I believe. It's because of the kind of faith that the Bible holds up as real faith. It's not the kind of faith that says, come to Jesus and all your problems are going to go away. It's the kind of faith that embraces life in all of its reality, with all of its highs and all of its lows. It's the kind of faith that understands that life is hard. And it's the kind of faith that John, the apostle, had. John went through this heartbreak of seeing Jesus nailed to a cross. He had received news on the, uh, after that, that, that of the death of all the apostles, Peter, Paul, Andrew, James. All the rest of these apostles in time died for their faith. He had learned of the, the destruction of Jerusalem where his fellow Jews had been put to death and carted off to be sold in the Roman slave markets. But he believed. And he invites you to believe with him. And as we go through this series, you know, my prayer is, is that we would have our faith and belief encouraged because it embraces the reality of life, but it also embraces the reality of what God has done through Jesus Christ. He died and rose again, that we would have victory over sin and death. I want to leave you with an encouragement. I asked Brenton to share a song with you called I Still Believe, and it was written by a guy by the name of Jer Jeremy Camp, who, like my friend Mike, went through a struggle where he lost his wife at an early age. And, and Jeremy wrote this song, and he talks about those times where it is hard to believe. And, and sometimes a song will just stick with you. And my prayer would be that this song would stick with you as you go about your life. If you're struggling to believe right now that this song and its lyrics would, would, would get embedded into your mind. I, I love the, the chorus. It says, I still believe in your faithfulness. 
I still believe in your truth. I still believe in your holy word. And even when I don't see, I still believe. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are there with us through the struggle and uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we can trust you, uh, not because we're trusting in trust or having faith in faith or believing in belief, but we can trust in you because of what you've done for us on the cross, and that you were raised from the dead, and Lord, that these things were seen by reliable witnesses that were so certain that they had seen them, that these people were willing to die for what they had experienced and what they had seen and what they were giving testimony to. And Lord, I I pray that uh, as we go through these hard times, and these are hard times that we're going through, Lord, uh, despite it all, Lord, I pray that uh, that we we would look not to an organization, not to a group of people, not to some holy place, but we would look to you, Jesus, and, uh, and Lord, to believe. And Lord, uh, that you would give us hope, faith, and love as we face the future. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Scattered words and empty thoughts seem to pour from my heart I've never felt so torn before seems I don't know where to start but it's now that I feel your grace fall like rain from every fingertip washing away my I still believe in your faithfulness And I still believe in your truth And I still believe in your holy word don't see I still believe Though the questions still fog up my mind With promises I still seem to bear Or even when answers slowly unwind It's my heart I see you prepare But it's now that I feel Your grace fall like rain From every fingertip Washing away my pain And I still believe in your faithfulness I still believe in your truth And I still believe in your holy word Even when I don't see, I still believe will for me and help me to know that you are near and I still believe in your faithfulness and I still believe in your truth 
still believe in your holy word even when I don't see I still believe I still believe yeah I still believe I still believe Thank you for joining us today. If God got your attention this morning, we would love to hear about it and answer any questions you might have or give you directions on how to take a next step in your own faith journey. You can get in touch with us personally by filling out a digital connection card by going to our website, centerpointutah.org. Click on the About Us tab and select Contact. We'd love to answer any questions or pray for you and just get to know you. Before you go, we'll have some discussion questions available on the screen from today's message. I encourage you to take a moment and discuss and apply these truths with your Centerpoint small group or with your friends and family in the room with you today. For those of you who call Centerpoint home, if you feel compelled to share what God's given you, you can give one of three easy ways. Thank you so much for your sacrificial generosity. It is so appreciated, and it equips us to continue sharing Jesus as the center point of Utah Valley. Be sure to join us next week for part two of I Still Believe. Until then, God bless.